Hi everybody, in this mini lecture, we're gonna be exploring how can we make our data visualizations more effective for ourselves to understand what's going on in the data, as well as as we're communicating out, as we're moving sort of from the exploratory data analysis into explanatory data analysis, as we're sort of explaining what our story actually is, how can we make them most effective? Again, I'm Kristen Hunter Thompson. Reach out if you have any questions. So this comes from a place of you don't have to master all of this. You don't have to memorize all of this. But I think it kind of was captured really well by Nathan Yao from flowingdata.com when he articulated the more tools you have in your toolbox, the less, less likely you're going to get stuck somewhere in the process. So I'm sharing a lot with you from the exposure, help you sort of think about things from new ways and just trying to build out and you know, expand those tools that you have in your toolbox as you're working with data. So we'll start with sort of an initial thinking of, I'm showing you three different bar graphs, um, which is a good bar graph. Take a moment, pause the video, give a sense and think about why you're making those choices as to which is a good bar graph or, or which of these are good bar graphs. Sorry, I shouldn't state that there's only one right answer to this question. So many of you may have been thinking of things like the color or whether or not you could read them or if they were 3D or 2D or their orientation. And these are the components that go into actually executing the ink on the page or um, in the data visualization world it's talked about as the grammar of making the data visualization and when we don't know anything about the data we often spend a lot of time thinking about those grammar those execution components and they are very they are important absolutely and we will talk a little bit about how to sort of the big picture how to frame some of those choices but what I want to push back on and think about is, is that all that really counts when we're thinking about if a graph is good or effective? Because when we mean a good visualization, we could mean maybe what, what is good is something that grabs the user's attention, or it's something that they can read, which goes a bit back to the, the grammar pieces, or that the user can understand the main point of the graph that we are trying to communicate, or that we, as the user of our data, as we're exploring our data, can understand the main point of what's going on in our data. It's not always an external user. We ourselves are also users of our data. Or is it that the user remembers and takes away that main point if we're, uh, when we're explaining whether it are our data visualizations? And the reality is, is that good means different things to different people and or in different situations. There's no one way or there's no sort of laundry list of do's and don'ts that apply to every single situation across the board. Designers have their own, data visualization designers have their own opinions and preferences and you do too. As you're exploring your data, you will have your own opinions and preferences of ways that makes it easier for you to make sense of the data that you have. And just to sort of bring home that point, there's, there's different things that we stress depending on who our audience is. And so this is just a three point framework to think about retention of information, the appeal of what they're looking at, and comprehension of what it is is being shared. And these three different communities, if you have an, a marketing community that you're working with, if it's an editorial or if it's an academic scientific, have different determinations of where they fall just across these three dimensions. Again, not for you to um, you know, need to remember any of this, but I think it's just important context of we make different choices in different situations and we stress, stress different things. But there are some things that we can take forward kind of almost irregardless of which field we're in, what purpose we have, how we're defining good in that individual component. And part of it has to do with how we as, as human beings see things and how that can help us explore the data. So we're gonna do a very brief introduction 
to some components of visual and perception science about how we visualize and perceive and make meaning from things and how that influences what we do with our data. So we remember we're really remarkable visual creatures, right? We could post this text for you to read or we could post this diagram and we, we will gravitate, those of us that um, have visual ability, will gravitate towards these visual reference cues because we can make sense of the information very quickly. <laughs> but here's the catch. Our brains discard about 99% of all sensory information almost immediately after perceiving it. So how do we, how do we um, find a happy balance between these two things, that we are remarkably visually driven, those of us that have visual ability, but that we forget and discard the vast majority of it that we see. Well, we can go from the fact that we do know some things about how we see things. And one is that we can only see a few things at once. So these are many, many lines, and you cannot make sense of all of these lines all at once. It varies, but a good rule of thumb is like four to maybe six things at a time is how much our brains can take in. Another thing is that we see things that stand out. Like this is how our brain, how our eyes and our brains work together is that we look for contrast and we see contrast really quickly within our environments or this, the visual environment that we are looking at. So, and we can leverage that. And there are some things that we're especially good at seeing differences of. So we can see differences in lengths. This is what we employ in our bar charts or our scatter plots or our line graphs. We can see differences in widths. We see differences in orientation, in shapes, in the overall size of something. And so those are kind of the physical characteristics of how it is built. But we also can see things like difference in hue or sort of what color it is that we're looking at or differences in intensity if it's the same color but it's a less intense or a more intense color and then position so similar to its sort of physical location in space if it's offset then that catches our eye more quickly and we're we're we see that difference of um, our brain and our eyes are looking for what is similar and what is different. Some other things that go into that. So that's what we see and what catches our eye. And then what we know is sort of what meaning we attribute to that. And so we, we look for patterns even when there are not patterns, which can sometimes be funny because when we work with our students, we spend a lot of time to help them see the patterns. But oftentimes that's we're trying to help them see the pattern that we want them to see in the data related to a specific content. In reality, we're really good at looking for patterns and we are really good at holding on to the anecdotal patterns that we have seen. And Gestalt principles are a set of principles that were determined a long time ago of different ways that we attribute meaning and that we make sense of things in the world. So things that are closer together that have a proximity jump out at us and we attribute meaning. So we perceive that these, this group of three and this group of three, this group of three must be more similar to itself, more so than to this group of three, as opposed to each of these groups of three, we presume are sort of similarly, or similarly different or similarly the same to one another because of their proximity. We attribute similarity in terms of me having meaning. And so the fact that across this group, these three blues, we attribute that that means something as opposed to the yellows or these blues as opposed to the groupings. If things are enclosed in a space, we presume that that has meaning and that draws our eye to it and for a reason that they are, that they are enclosed. We also see sort of general movement. And so our eye kind of sees that this top line is going here and that we see another movement of a line going here and, and we sort of presume that maybe these go together and these go together. Our eye is also really good at filling in blank spaces um, and so it doesn't have to be a full enclosure but we can fill in the space to presume 
what is happening in between. So kind of A and C, we'll presume, we will perceive that B happened in between and we will, we will fill that in even if we don't have information telling us that B actually happened. Continuity has to do with sort of our, we like things to fluidly fit together and therefore we presume that things have fluidly fit together or that they build or sequence or that they're, they're in a series. We experience the world through the chronological order of our lives and therefore our brains perceive things in terms of happening in sequences and in series. Connection is that although these shapes, the square shapes are similar, we perceive because they're connected to these blue dots that it's actually more related to this group and to what it's connected to than to each other. And we also give, well, we perceive what is in the foreground versus the background and what that means in terms of information and meaning to us. So these aren't things that necessarily influence um, how you make a bar chart, right? Or how you, does, how you get Google Sheets or Excel or whatever graphing program you're using to create that scatter plot for you. But how we, just, how we develop them and how we annotate and how we interact with those data visualizations, we can leverage some of these, the attributes that we quickly, easily see, and then how we make meaning of those attributes and of these groupings or patterns or connections to our advantage. There are a few other things when it comes to how we make meaning and how we make sense that do influence our ability to interpret. And some great work by Cleveland McGill and Munzer have looked at specifically um, what are things that are easiest for our brain to make sense of and to interpret, and that is a position in comparison to a common scale. So this is a scatter plot, a bar chart, sort of how this goes to this scale versus this goes to this scale and how they differ. And then similarly, a difference in length, be it to a common scale or, or anything. We're really good at picking out those distances and lengths. But you might be thinking, there are a lot of other ways that we have to visual, that we visualize things in our data and visualizations. And that's totally true. Some of them are easier and some of them are harder for us to make sense of. So I've included some of these here and we can start to pick this apart. So um, we're not very good at determining angles. We tend to overestimate acute angles and underestimate obtuse angles, making all geometry teachers proud that we can remember what those are. Um, we are really bad at comparing the curvature and taking information from curvature. We're also really bad at identifying differences in area. We're really good along one dimension, um, but not really good across two dimensions. And we are even worse at understanding differences across three dimensions. So when it comes to comparing and contrasting or seeing how things are similar or different as we're doing those comparisons, as we're trying to see relationships, this is why these kinds of graphics, so pie charts, 3D graphs, tree maps, um, bubble charts can be more challenging for us to make sense of than say a scatter plot or a bar chart. So some of it has to do with just our familiarity and our practice. We can get to a place where we can make sense of these, but we have to train our brain because these in general are harder comparisons for our brain, for our brain and our eye and visual system to make. Color is also a thing. It influences sort of how well we can make sense of different things. Another important thing to think about is that we try to make meaning, as I've said, like we look for patterns, we try to find series, we try to find sequences, we try to make connections, and we go off of a lot of conventions. And those conventions vary, but we're gonna talk about some, of, some general conventions. So this is an example of a graph that I saw, or a map that I saw a few years ago of Australia, and I did a double take, because I was thinking, oh my gosh, there's so many rivers in Australia. I thought, you know, that just didn't sit with my understanding of the geography of Australia, of where it sat in the world. And then, I, because I looked at the blue and these blue squiggly lines, and I presumed that they were rivers, because in other maps that I've looked at, 
blue, blue squiggly lines have been rivers in the middle of continents. And then I realized that the blue squiggly lines are actually natural gas pipelines. So that's an example of a convention that I was using to make sense of this, this map, but it didn't actually help me in making sense of it. So what are some common conventions? Up is good, down is bad. High should be up, low should be down. Um, hierarchies move from up to down. So we like generally move down a hierarchy. Um, up is north and down is south when it comes to maps. So let's, let's look at an example of this. So here is a graph that was run by Reuters of number of gun deaths in from the mid 1980s until the mid 2010s and this it was looking at it was articulating in 2005 florida enacted the stand your ground gun law and they built out this graphic so that it would be like right it would look like blood bleeding down the page and what that what that convention does is that it sets up this we've pointed out through the annotation here that the gun law went into effect and then the line goes down. And so what that leaves many viewers with understanding is, oh, that's a good thing, gun deaths went down. But if you actually look at our axis, it's flipped. And that this is the total number of, of deaths due to guns. And so instead actually what it should, what, it, what the numbers show is that the deaths increased. I'm not saying anything political about this, this gun law, but just stating that we work off of conventions and our brain makes sense of meaning long before we read the axes, long, long before we read any labels. Our brain has jumped to making patterns and conclusions. So we need to be, it can be helpful to be aware of those conventions as we're building out our graphs. So some conventions in terms of setup we perceive and we presume that time moves from left to right in two-dimensional space if you're in three-dimensional space time is back and it moves towards the forward towards the foreground this is, we use this language a lot like we go um you know back in time or forward into the future um, when data points are connected we presume that that has meaning and that categories are arranged or plotted from one extreme to the other. So that there's, there's a reason we have plotted or we have listed the categories the way that they are. We presume that. Whether or not the designer actually did it, we as the viewer presume, presume that. There's some color metaphors or conventions that can be helpful to think of as we're picking our colors. Red is often associated with negative, green is positive, if you can actually determine the difference between red and green. Red means, can mean hot and active, whereas blue can mean cold and inactive. Light colors are emptier or sort of of lower value than darker ones. Darker ones pop for us. Like colors mean like things. Different colors mean that they are different things. And gray is background or secondary. Like we don't really pay much attention to gray. Another convention that can be helpful to remember is that when we read, we are taught at a really early age in the Western Hemisphere to read from left to right and top to bottom. So that if you are writing prose, if you're writing a story, you have a general sense of how your readers are going to be reading through what it is that you are writing. When we look at visualizations, we don't go in any particular order. So this is one random eye track of myself through this graph um, on one given day. But the takeaway is, is your eye track would look different because how we perceive visualizations varies by our gender, how we're displaying it, the mood that we are in, how much sleep that we have had, how much familiarity we have with that chart type, different things like that. So there's a wide range of things that influences how we make meaning of the information that's coming at us, and we do it all in different ways. Whew, that was a lot. Okay, so how can we take some of that and some so we can take some of that of visual and perception science to sort of make some more conscious choices about how we're putting together our data visualizations both as we're just exploring them so we can make sense of the data as well as once we're sharing them out and explaining the story within our data what i want to do is spend a few minutes for those that are interested to think about 
how to design effective visualizations. What are some things that we can learn from folks that spend all day, every day, thinking about making data visualizations for large members of the public? So the first thing I leave with, uh, I share with you are six questions to think through as you're working with your data and thinking about how, how to build them out. And we, you know, we've talked about a few of these or we've sort of alluded to a few of these. It's, what are you trying to find out? What's your testable question? What are you trying to represent? So of that testable question, what are you trying to show in your data visualization? What are you expecting to see? It can be helpful to think of that ahead of time because that can help you make choices as to how you're gonna graph it, what graph type choice you might use. Um, how would you represent this result? So again, sort of what graph type makes the most sense based off of your question and what data you have and, and what's that sample of the data? What do the results actually show? Like when you make your visualization, even if it's just for you as you're exploring your data, what does it show you? And then is the representation that you picked actually a useful one? Does it link back to your testable question and the data that you have? There are a few things, sort of a few suggestions that I can leave you with on easy choices that you can make to make your visualization more persuasive for, for you or for others as you're communicating with your graphs. And the first one has to do with find the main idea. So we're often taught um, and the default options in our graphing programs often leave it to be such that we just plot everything. <laughs> we just sort of put it out there and every, everything is there to look at. But really it's so, but that's not very persuasive either for you as you're looking through your data to figure out what's going on or to share with others. So if you're just saying like, I want to compare urban and ur suburban and urban poverty populations decade by decade. Okay. That actually influences what sample of data that you collect. But once you have your data, what's the story you want to tell? And maybe it's that I want to convince people or I want to show people that suburban poverty is huge and a growing problem that's rapidly overtaking urban poverty. Okay, great. Make that stand out, right? If that's what you want to show, then make some choices that really emphasize that. Make it stand out, you know, so this is now, we've used the difference of color and similarity and connection to make that pop out. We've isolated it and we've emphasized that's the piece that we think is important to stand out. We can also adjust what, what is around it uh, to better help us see what it is that we wanna see or have others see what it is that we want them to see from our visualizations. So rather than this being a graph of all of the survey responses that came through from a survey that you did of what are the most important aspects of this product that make you want to buy it. It's a lot of information and you don't really know where to go to look for it. Well, maybe you could just say, well, we're just interested in those of the under 35 with those of the over 65. And sort of across these groups, what are some differences? Now it really pops out that the under 35 appreciate our new features in mobile version, but our over 65s like the ease of use and the cost. So we can more quickly see some comparisons. So that's removing different reference points. We can add reference points. So if you're providing a graphic, you can provide a second graphic next to it that helps people interpret this first one. Or you can shift the reference point. So rather than a graph of hours lost per year to traffic, comparing to these two countries, okay, we can make a comparison and see that it's a lot more hours in the United Kingdom than the United States, but that still doesn't really mean much to me. So we can change the reference point. I don't think about hours in my life, but I certainly think about work days in my life. So this is an example of shifting the reference point. So these are just some different ways that you can make some small adjustments to, to your graph as you're exploring your data to help you get a sense of what actually are the data showing me and what do I wanna tell from them for yourself as you're exploring as well as when you're sharing it out to explain. Okay, it, would, it wouldn't be fair if I didn't end on the like, don't lie and don't deliberately, deliberately mislead with your data. Um, 
It's not an effective way to communicate and we need to be truthful and honest with our data. What our evidence shows are what they show. So if it turns out that the data aren't showing at all what we expected, that's fine. That could actually be a really exciting story to get a sense of why, why is that? And you can dive in deeper. Maybe it's you don't have enough, your sample is not large enough. Maybe it's because you didn't have a, well, your understanding of the phenomenon or the system doesn't actually jive with what's going on. That's interesting. That's where we can ask more questions and learn more about it. But manipulating our graphs to show what we want to show rather than what the data show, not okay. So this has been a rapid fire look at how we can leverage some aspects of visual and perception science and some quick sort of tricks of the of graphing design, data visualization design into our graphs as we are doing our exploratory data analysis and as we're moving forward into determining what our story is and sharing our story with others. If you have questions about this or any other aspect of working with your data, please feel free to let me know. I'm happy to answer your questions at any time. Thanks so much. Have a good day.